This week's episode is sponsored by Ryan at Change. If you are looking to get involved in e-commerce and build a successful online business, then check out my good friend Ryan, who I have been working with the last few years and attended many events and retreats all around the world, spending time with members who are making some serious money. I have been promoting Ryan for a while now because I believe in what he does and not only has he helped and supported me build my own businesses, but I have seen firsthand how he helps and supports his members take their businesses to new levels and give them financial freedom. So if you are interested in getting into e-commerce and building successful online stores, then message Ryan on his Instagram at RyanJB to join his winning team. You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you are notified for when my next podcast goes live. And boom, we're on. And today's guest, we've got Anthony Ruggiano Jr. Anthony, how are you? Oh, I'm great, thanks. Looking forward to being here. Yeah, it's good to have you on. Obviously, you were on the smash hit show, Get Gotti, which was massive, but you've lived a life of crime as well. Uh, your father was a proper gangster. He was a made man, is that correct? Yeah, my father was made uh, in 1953. He was made by Albert Anastasia, and he was the boss of the Mangano family, which later on became the Gambino family. Yeah, he was a hitman for the Gambino family. You ended up getting involved in murders and robberies and all the mad stuff as the <laughs> mafia do. But before we get into it, no, Anthony, I always like to go back to the start with my guests, mm. get a bit of understanding about you, where you grew up and how it all began. Yeah. So I was born in Brooklyn. You know, my father had just got out of prison. He was 25 years old. Um, matter of fact, the year my father became a main member of the mafia, I was born the same year, 1953. So I, I was born into that lifestyle. And all, so his partner was a maid member, Tony Lee. They were always together. They were always in my house. So I was always around mob guys since birth. So, um, so and, and, and I always knew things were like a little different than other people's houses, you know? But I really didn't know what it was at the time um, until I got a little older. When I got a little older and I branched off, because in New York back then in my neighborhood, the kids stayed on their block and we played stickball and all that. But when we got a little older, we drifted off into the neighborhood. And when I drifted off into the neighborhood, when I was like 12 or 13, I would go to this corner where this pizzeria was and the older kids would see me and they would point out and they would, I would hear them whispering and go, that's Fat Andy's son. And that's when I started to figure out and find out about who my father was. Did you go to school? Yeah, I went to school. I wasn't really a good student. I had an issue with my spelling. Um, I went to Catholic school for four years, and then I, I was uh, left back. Back then, they held me back in the fourth grade, and then after that, my mother put me in. Uh, it's funny because my mother put me into public school, and I started getting bullying. I started getting bullied. And um, every day, my mother would wait for me outside the school, and I would come out the school door, and I would run to my mother. And then one day when I came out of the school door, my mother wasn't there. So I had to make a decision whether to keep getting bullied or fight. And I made a decision to stop fighting. And a little later on, I found out the reason why my mother wasn't there was that day my father came home and told my mother, where are you going? And she said, I'm going to go get Anthony. And he said, no, you're not going to get Anthony anymore. And he stopped my mother from coming to get me. So it was either keep getting bullied or fight. So I, I had a fight. <laughs> yeah. So that was my childhood. And then, uh, but I wasn't a good student. When I got into junior high school, I started playing hooky. I started smoking weed. It was the 1960s, you know, listening to rock. And, uh, and uh, I got uh, thrown out of high school at 16. And that's when I went to work for my father. Was that a life lesson from your dad to try and toughen you up? Yeah, without a doubt. Yeah, you know that's why he stopped my mother from coming to get me because you know I would come, I came home with a black eye, and he would tell me, you know, you got to stop fighting, and um, 
And yeah, he stopped her from coming. And I didn't know that at the time. I just knew she wasn't there. And, and I started to, and, and then, uh, I, so I fought, you know, I didn't want to keep getting beat up. And I, so I fought and, uh, they, I stopped getting bullied and I didn't become a bully. Thank God. But the bully that bullied me became my friend. Actually, he's still my friend. Yeah. So yeah, that was definitely a life lesson. And that was one of the many life lessons I got. But you know, what well, that was, I guess maybe you could say right, light, left, light, right life lesson but later on the life lessons were now i know what were not uh were detrimental to me you know because i did a lot of time when did you know your dad was a gangster what age when i was about 15 i knew for sure you know um i knew like i said you know i i say this all the time i knew something was different like even when i went to school i talk about this all the time so you know when you go to school the teacher would ask you what your father does for a living and you would say my father's a carpenter my father was an electrician so i would go home and i would ask my father you know i have to tell this class tomorrow what you do for a living and he would tell me tell them i work in the dry cleaners and I knew that wasn't true. Like, I knew he didn't work in the dry cleaners, but I didn't know what he did. But I would go to school the next day, and I would repeat that lie. And I would say, oh, my father works in the dry cleaners. But I knew that wasn't true. But when I became a teenager, because then what happened was he started taking me to social clubs, because in New York there was a lot of social clubs, and all the mob guys had social clubs. So when I started hanging out in the neighborhood, he didn't want me to get hurt or he didn't want me to get in trouble and he wanted people to look after me. So he started taking me to all these clubs. That's the first time I met John Gotti. He took me to the Bergen Hunt Fish Club. He took me to other clubs and he would bring me in and say, this is my son, Anthony. You know, he's going to be in the neighborhood. And that's when I started figuring out what was going on. What was that like? Because we know now that life back then, it was glamorous. You watched the movies. It was sexy. Men had power. They dressed nice. They had money. They had all the women. <laughs> Obviously, we'll touch on it later in the interview, how destructive that life is. But was that glamorous for you as a young kid, seeing these powerful men and having all the attention? Oh, I loved it. Because when I, was, when I did travel with my father and we walked into any place we walked in, he always got treated special. Like we went to a restaurant, he never waited for a table. The owner of the restaurant would sit with us. When we walked into a bar, everybody would like, sort of like the atmosphere would change. So, uh, so yeah, you know, I definitely felt special being around, being around my father and then later on being around other wise guys. So yeah, I definitely was uh, attracted to it big time. So your dad, did he want you involved in the business? Did your mom ever try to keep you away from it? He didn't want me involved in it. I mean, when I got thrown out of school at 16 he, he he wouldn't talk to me he got he he didn't know how to really um reprimand me he never had a father my grandfather died when he was six years old so he was actually raised by mob guys too so um even though he was this big gangster he was like a uh he was like a teddy bear at home you know with, with us and he didn't talk to me so i called up my uncle his older brother my uncle frank who and he came over the house and we sort of had a sit down at, at the kitchen table my father my uncle and myself, and my uncle told my father, listen, you got to get this kid a job. He's not going to go back to school. He doesn't want to go back to school. And my father goes, all right, I'll get you a job on construction. And I said, I don't want to work on construction. And he says, well, what do you want to do? I said, I want to work for you. And he just sat back and he looked at me and he goes, you want to work for me? And he said, okay, remember one thing, working for me, going to jail is all part of the job. And I, I was, and I was okay. You know, that's how messed up I was. Or I said, fine. And the next day he put me to work in a blackjack game. What did you have to do? I just had to just hang out there really, you know, and just watch the game and, uh, you know, um, nothing really the crap game. Then right after that, I went to work in a dice game because there was, um, no casinos back then. It was before the casino. So th the mob had big dice games in all the boroughs. And I would work, I worked in a dice game in the Bronx. Th and there I, I cashed the chips. I watched the table. I walked winners out to their car. You know, I did whatever I needed to do. And that was the beginning. And then I, and then I started writing numbers and selling, uh, you know, uh, and then, and then I just got involved. And then just one thing to another, and violence came into the picture and it was just a progressive thing. What was the first time you'd, giving somebody any sort of violence or hurt anyone what age were you the first time i got arrested for any kind of act of violence i was i was i i was 20 20 21 i uh, i was in a bar and i was having a drink and i was drinking in this bar and this big irish guy was elbowing me and um he was with his friends so i asked him you know to stop and he cursed me 
So being that he was with all his friends, I left the bar and I waited outside and I, and I got a bat and I waited for him to come out of the bar. When he walked out of the bar, I hit him on the head with a bat and I busted open his head and uh, I got arrested actually. He actually pressed charges on me and then he later on dropped the charges, but I actually got arrested for that. That was the first time I got, I, I got, I actually, that was the worst violent thing I did at that point. You know, I had fights, fist fights and all that, but that was the first time I actually tried to really hurt somebody was, was this Irish fella that was in the spa drinking. It was in my neighborhood. And then he had me arrested and, uh, you know, my father reached out to him and, and he didn't come to court and they, they dismissed the charges. Because obviously people watch the movies and that's the way it happens. If someone's got witnesses, they go and intimidate the witnesses, maybe kill the witnesses. Yeah. Is that all legit then? Does that, does that actually happen? Oh yeah, back in the day, yeah, that happened all the time. I mean, people didn't come to court. You know, once they found out who you, you are or what was going on or they were paid, yeah, it happened. It happened to me. I mean, he didn't come to court. They dismissed the charges. It happened. Yeah, now that that was, uh, and then there was, but you got to remember back at that time, it was a lot of corruption. The police force was corrupt. There was corrupt judges. Uh, it's not like today, back then. So there was ways to get around things back then that aren't existing anymore. So yeah, that, that definitely is for real. When did you get involved with the serious stuff? Well, I mean, as I as I got older, then you know, um, I was involved. You know, like I, I knew, like um, like there was a guy. Um, if I knew, yeah, I, I, like so, I knew they were going to clip somebody, and I and my father would tell me like this guy's going to go, and we would I would go out to dinner with people, and I would know like that week they were going to die. You know, like there was this Irish guy that hung out. Um, there was this kid, Danny, that hung out with my father. Um, they thought he was an informant and, and he got killed. And, you know, I remember the week before he got killed, we took him out for dinner and I knew he was going to die. Um, another murder conspiracy I was involved in, um, this guy, Frankie Geish, um, he owed us money, but he, he, he committed like a really heinous homicide in my neighborhood. And, uh, they had a big sit down, my father, John Gotti and all of them. And they called me over and they said, listen, Frankie Gish got to go. Um, I said, all right. You know, like it didn't phase me. And um, we, uh, so there was this diner called the Lindenwood Diner in my neighborhood. And the, and I was supposed to, he was supposed to meet me there. The, the setup was he was going to come and meet me in front of this diner because he owed us money, Shylock money. We were Shylock of money with him, him my brother and I. And I was going to bring him, get in his car and, make him drive around the diner and they were going to kill him behind the diner but he didn't show up his uncle showed up and i'm standing in front of the diner and the car pulls up and it's his uncle and i look in the car and his uncle says get in the car and i get in the car and i said where's your nephew and he looked at me the uncle he goes do you think we're gonna let you kill my nephew and i says come on we're not gonna do that he's my friend you know but it, realistically we were gonna kill him so I was involved in a lot of stuff like that. And actually I was involved in one murder myself, you know, my brother-in-law, um, we murdered him. He, he did something, he, he did something that, uh, that he shouldn't have done. And we, and that was, uh, unfortunately we murdered him. So I was involved in a lot of violence, but I, and I knew of a lot of things that were jumping off and, uh, and, uh, so yeah. How was that feeling knowing a friend of yours then has to get killed and you have to set it up? What goes through your mind? Do you just have to block out every single emotion and become cold to that life? Yeah, you know, that's a good question. It's like you have no conscience, you know? It's like you're, you're so ingrained in that lifestyle and you know like that's part of it. And and yeah, you know, it didn't even phase me back then. Like, um, like when I'm stand, like it didn't phase, like talking about it, like how you and I are talking about it, like, we would discuss a murder like you and I are doing this interview and it wouldn't phase me at that point. Right before it happened, I would get a little nervous, but after it was done, it would just like not, it would be, it's gone. Like just for a moment, I would feel like, I guess because of the adrenaline, I would get nervous, but after that it would be gone. But to discuss it, it was just like a discussion like you and I are having. It's just part of what we did. It's like getting arrested. You know, I was talking about this this last night. You know, like people ask me, weren't you afraid of getting arrested? It wasn't even a thought in my mind. It was just part of, you know, I knew eventually I may get arrested. And unfortunately I did get arrested because I spent almost 14 years in prison. But it was, it's not, it's like smoking cigarettes. Do you think you're going to get lung cancer? No, it's, you know, it's the same mentality. When did you start looking around and thinking everybody's fucking a psycho? It's a psychotic behavior. It's everybody is crazy. 
yeah. like to having that discussion, killing friends and mm. turning on each other. And was there any moments in your twenties when you looked around and thought, "This is crazy," or we just so like you says ingrained in it where mm. this was your life? At that point, no, I, I, it didn't phase me. My when it, when 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 I started seeing it in a different light is when I got older. When I got into my forties, when I started getting. When the life started wearing me out a little bit, like when I started doing a lot of time, in the beginning, no, it was just what we did. Later on, like, I guess I started to develop a conscience, you know, and, and that's when it started to, the lifestyle started rubbing me along uh, the wrong way. The last time I did time, when I was in prison, um, the last time my father had passed away, John Gotti had passed away, my father's partner had passed away, and and the mob did. They took a lot of stuff from my family. Um, a lot of illegal monies disappeared, and it started to turn me off. And I started to think about that. And my son got older. My son now is seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, and I and I would look, and my son would come and visit me, and I would look at my son, and I and and I would think of the conversations of me and my father, like planning a murder. Like me and my father sat down and planned the murder. You know, and and I could never do that. I, I I and I would look at my son, and I and I and I and at that point, I knew that it's not normal for a father and son to plan a murder. Actually, I talked about this too last night. My father actually got mad at me because he told me, he asked, told me that to kill somebody, and I told him no, and he got mad at me because I said no. My sister had gotten in trouble. My sister was messing around with this kid from the neighborhood. This was after we killed her husband. We already killed my sister's husband, and now she's dating this kid in the neighborhood, and they were using drugs. But the kid wasn't mobbed up. He was just a kid from the neighborhood that was using drugs. He, he was dating, going out with my sister. They got arrested in a stolen car. He stole a car. He picked up my sister. He got arrested. He had some stolen credit cards on him, and... They both got arrested. So we bailed my sister out. I went to visit my father. And my father, I told him what happened. And he told, he says to me, does this kid know who I am? I said, he's a kid from the neighborhood. He doesn't know nothing about the mob or nothing. He's a kid. He uses drugs. He says, well, you know what you got to do here with this kid, right? So I looked at him. I go, what? I said, I'm not doing that. He goes, what do you mean? He goes, yeah, you know what you got to do here. I said, yeah, let's kill everybody until she meets a rocket scientist. And he got mad. Like, he goes, you know what? I'll take care of it myself. Don't worry about it. I'll, I'll handle it on my own. <clears throat> so I said, all right, you handle it. And I left the visit. I went back to my neighbor and I sent for this kid. And I said to him, listen, you got to get out of here because you're going to go. You got to stay out of this neighborhood. And he did. He stood away and he, he didn't get killed or anything. But uh, I gave him a pass because he wasn't involved. You know, he, if he was involved, if he was mobbed up and he was w wise guys, then maybe I wouldn't have gave him a pass. But that's when, with my son, that's when I realized that fa that's not a normal conversation for father and son to have or a normal argument to have with your father that you don't want to kill somebody. Yeah, because your dad was 100% about that life though what was some people say he's killed seven people uh, ten people he is a, he was he killed a lot of people he did he started doing he he was did a lot of work early like he and he told me you know he he told me about some of the stuff he did like so when he he got out of prison in the early 50s and he hooked, he hooked up with this wise guy charlie wagons who was with albert anastasia and he told me the first conversation he had, so he was driving Charlie around and Charlie took him out of the club one day and asked him a question. He goes, listen, when you uh, would you be willing to, to, to kill somebody without asking any questions? If we asked you to do something like that, would you do it without asking questions? And he said, yes. He was only in his early 20s at the time. And then he said the first time he actually did a mob hit, he said he was he was actually still living with my grandmother. Like he was a kid. He was only in his early 20s. He was living with my grandmother. And they picked him up, actually picked him up at my grandmother's house with the victim in the car. And he said he got in the back of the car and they drove away. And he's telling me the story. And then he said, he went like this with his finger. He, he went and then the car pulled out away from grandma's house. And we drove a couple of miles, he said, and then I whispered in his ear. And he went like this with his finger. And I says to him, what do you mean you whispered in his ear? And he said, I shot him in the head. You know, I whispered in his ear. And that was the first piece of work he did. And then he did some other work with them. And then what happened was the books were closed. So when the books are closed, normally people don't get made. 
except if they're special cases. And the <clears throat> books were closed in 1953 and Albert Anastasia, whose nickname was the High Executioner, opened up the books just to, to make my father and one other person it because they were special cases because of the work they did, which work in mob lingo is homicides. Mm -hmm. When was the first time you went to prison? The first time I went to prison was 1978. I went to prison when I was uh, 23 for, uh, um, we uh, robbed the liquor warehouse. I robbed the liquor warehouse. I got convicted. I went to trial. I got convicted. I got five years. I did two and a half years. I got out um, in 1980, um, and then I went back to prison. I got, got arrested a bunch of times in the 80s, and then I got arrested again in, 1990, in 1989 for um, policy, which now is the lotto, but back then it was illegal. Everything today in America, everything that I went to jail for is legal now. You want to bet sports? I got an app. I went to jail for that. You know, now the government does it. It's legal, you know, mm -hmm. everything. It's comical. So I went to jail in nine. I got arrested in 89, and then I got rearrested by the Organized Crime Task Force in, in 90. I went to prison in 91. I did uh, 16 months for policy. I got out in What's 90. That? Numbers, lotto, the lotto. It was mm -hmm. legal numbers. And then I got out in, um, I got out in 92, and then I had a good run after that. I, from 92 to 95, I, I, I was doing really, really well. All illegal. My whole life was, every waking moment I committed, I mean, I had chops, shops, credit card fraud. I mean, I, uh, uh, I, had, I took over a vending company. I extorted a vending company. I mean, I was just nothing legal. Never had a legal job. And then I got arrested for bookmaking in 95, a big, bookmaking, Brooklyn, Queens, Organized Crime Task Force bookmaking case. And I took a plea. I got two to four. I took a plea. I got two to four. While I was in state prison doing that sentence, I got indicted by the feds in Miami and Florida on a big RICO, federal RICO case with some uh, major, with, with Nikki Carraza, who at that time was one of the acting bosses for John Gotti. He was on the committee that ran the, the Gambino family because I was very close with him. My father actually proposed him to be made. So we had a great relationship and I got indicted while I was in prison on another case in Florida. So the marshals came, they took me to Florida. I took, I copped out, I got another 10 years. I went back to Florida and then I was in Attica and that's when I sort of said like, what am I doing, man? You know, what am I, I'm in my forties, I'm back in jail. I just got 10 years. Now I'm going to have to do like nine years. I had two kids at the time now. And that's when I started hitting the bottom. Like, like that's when I started like saying, what's, what am I doing here? You know, I'm back in jail again. My kids are getting bigger and uh, I wind up doing eight years and three months. When I got, did your addiction start? Because you had an addiction. Me? Did you have a coke addiction? Yeah, well, I, 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 I got addicted to cocaine in the 80s. You know, in the 70s, we started blowing coke, you know, the discos and everything. And it was all fun and games. And in the 80s, I, ha I, I had an issue with it. And in 88, I went to treatment. And I stopped. I'll be clean now in January, 35 years. It's a long yeah, time. Yeah, I'll be clean 35. And then I got out in 04. I did eight years and three months. I got out in 04, 2004. And then a couple of months later, I got locked up for a murder that we committed 30 years before that, you know? And then, uh, How were you treated in prison? Mafia oh, guys. It's great. We had the run, of, you know, we had the best jobs, the best cells. No, uh, we, 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 did good, we, we did good bids. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, we had food. People looked out for us. No, everywhere, no matter, every jail I went to, People were already there waiting for me, like with, a, with you know, shower slippers and food. And, you know, it was, you know, it was, we, we, we had a good in there. Italian guys have a good in there. Did you and your dad do a murder together? No, we never, we were in prison together, but we were never in the same prison together. What's that like when you're in prison with your dad? Well, That's was, when you know it's deranged, isn't it? I was not in the same prison. Oh, we, really we, we were in prison at the same time, but in different facilities. We were mm -hmm. never together in the same facility. Yeah. Yeah. So the murder that came back and Bit you in the ass. Was that the one you killed your brother in law? Yeah, the but one. Your brother in law, did he not beat your mother up or something? Yes, he beat my mother up. Yeah, he beat my mother up. And uh, I was actually in treatment when that happened. I was in treatment when that happened. And, and I found out about it when I got out of treatment in 1988. And uh, and uh, yeah, and then uh, we, we my father okayed it and John Gotti okayed it. And uh, I'm sorry for it today, you know, because, you know, my niece, my sister, you know, it was a tragedy. But back then it didn't even, it wasn't even like, yeah, he's got to go. You know, he beat my mother up and then we killed him. Why did they beat your mom up? 
they had a misunderstanding. There was some, you know, he was probably drunk. You know, he was drinking all night. They were at a party, and uh, there was it was over a bill, and uh, and he just was a violent guy. He was a criminal himself. He was an armored truck robber. You know, he was no angel. He was a dangerous kid. I mean, him and his friend Peter Sakari, they had killed a couple of kids in the neighborhood. I mean, they, he was no joke. This kid, so uh, um, he just started choking her and. Uh, my ex-wife broke it up, and uh, then when I, I told my father, I went up to visit my father, and uh, that was it, you know, and that was the end of it. The one with your sister and her, her boyfriend from then in the car crash, yeah. I understand him not getting killed, yeah. but if somebody beats up your mum, yeah. it doesn't matter who you are, yeah. there's always a chance that you're going to go and kill the guy. Yeah. No matter if you're a gangster or whoever, it's... Yeah, strangling well, your mum nearly killed your mum like yeah. no matter who you are that's fucking yeah. wrong and and to make matters worse he knew the deal he knew who who her father was and his own friends his own friends when he started dating my sister his own friends told him listen don't date her that's fat andy's daughter you don't want to fucking date her don't date her and he didn't listen and then he did what he did you know so uh, and he and to make matters worse he was dangerous he was dangerous himself. He was capable of killing one of us, you know. So, so that compounded the, the the problem. So, who killed him? Well, I picked. We we get we made up a scenario, and I picked him up at his house that morning, and I drove him to a, a club, and um, we walked him in the club in the back of the club, and this guy Skinny Dom shot him. I walked him in, and we took him in the back room, and uh, he was executed in the back room. And he had kids with your sister? He had a daughter with my sister, yeah. What did your sister say? Well, she didn't know what happened. She don't, you know, he disappeared and we get, made a whole, a whole big scenario up. Um, and uh, when I decided to cooperate with the government, I went to my sister to give her some closure and I told her and my mother what happened. And it's funny because I was sitting at the, not funny, but I was sitting at a table with my mother. My sister, she was screaming at me, how could you do that? Uh, they always surmised it was us, but they didn't know for sure. So when I went, when I left to go, when I decided to cooperate with the government, I told the FBI agents, before I leave, I want to go speak to my mother and my sister and tell them what happened so they have closure. Because my mother felt guilty, you know. Um, so I went to see them and um, I told my sister and she just started screaming at me, how could you do that, you know, and, and she just flipped out. And my mother was just sitting at the table and my sister ran out of the house and my mother, like this expression came over her face and she just looked at me and she said to me, I can't believe he made you do stuff like that. Like my father made me kill people. He goes, I can't believe he made you do stuff like that. You know, so she felt bad about that, you know, like she just couldn't believe that he allowed. And that goes back to how abnormal that lifestyle is that a father and son could do something like that and think it's okay. And it didn't only happen to me. I know other sons and that I know friends of mine that were, their fathers were wise guys and killers. You know, John Gotti was a killer. His son, Michael Francis, who we both know, his father, Sonny, was a killer. You know, you know, like it goes on and on and on, and and we think it's okay back then, and now today, Michael and I, and we know that it was an abnormal. You know, it's not okay, and it wasn't okay, and we were not good guys. Yeah, I don't even let my kids have sleepovers. <laughs> yeah, <right>. Imagine that. <laughs> yeah, you know, used to go kill somebody, yeah. right? Yeah, it's deranged. It's thinking. crazy. Like, it's, it's fucking but you know what? But, but but it's deranged now. But to them, to us, it's it's it was it wasn't deranged. This, it was like it was a, it was a whole new society. They hate the government. It was a whole different way of thinking. Like we they we thought that the public were fools. Like the publics were, were like my father told used to tell me, don't ever feel sorry for the no matter what we do to the public, don't ever feel sorry for them. He goes because they vote for them people. And he used to tell me the government that's the real those are the real gangsters because that's the real mafia, the government. He goes and these and so don't ever feel sorry for the public. That was their mentality. Mm -hmm. Even when nine eleven happened, they wanted more cops to run into the building. Well, who was the maddest person? Who was the scariest person you'd ever surround yourself with? I mean, I wasn't really scared of anybody, but the most dangerous person, I, I mean, outside of my father, probably John Gotti, Roy DeMeo, Arneel De La Croce. He had like, Arneel De La Croce was a very stern man. He was good to me, you know? He, thank God, he liked me. But he was very stern, and like he had that look, like you knew, like he would give you this look, and you knew like 
not to fuck around. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But uh, I wasn't never really personally scared of anybody, but I knew the most dangerous people, I would say more dangerous, like was Roy DeMeo. Who's he? The Gemini Club, he was just was chopping people up. Him and the Gemini twins, the, he got killed. Paul Castellano had him killed. Um, they wrote a couple of books about him. He was a mad, he was a mad dog killer. Uh, John Gotti was dangerous. I mean, I knew dangerous people that were capable of killing you, like my father, like kill you, like in a blinker. Like my father used to tell me, you see that guy right there at the end of the bar? Next week, I'm going to make him a blinker on a Cadillac. And the next week, the guy was gone. Like it was just a crazy, you know, like uh, they're dangerous, dangerous people. You know, anybody that could take you out for dinner today, like right now, we're having a conversation and then let, come on, James. Take a walk with me, and let's go next door. And we go next door, and you get shot in the head. Was there a lot of that back then? It wasn't a lot, but I mean, it was when it was when it was what when it was. You know, I'm, I'm not going to say it happened every day, but it happened quite often. You know. Yeah. What was Gotti like? What was John Gotti like? What was he like? Did you know him before the Castellano? Oh, I knew him from killer. when I was a little kid. I knew him before he even got straightened out. He was always he, he was always a gangster. You know, he was. He was a, he 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 grew up in my father's neighborhood. My father comes from East New York. It's a neighborhood in Brooklyn, in Bronzeville, Brooklyn, and they all come from that neighborhood. Murders Incorporated started out in that neighborhood. That's the neighborhood they started out in. And John was a teenager in that neighborhood after he moved from the Bronx. So he knew my father from when he was a teenager. But he he winded up with just try him. Actually, my father and John Gotti were proposed into the mafia by the same made member charlie wagons proposed my father and straightened out my father and straightened out john Gotti. so they're sort of like well they had the same sponsor more or less into the mob john and my father so i knew him for years i knew him since i was 13 years old john so when he became the boss does that then benefit your dad because they were so close it benefited my father unfortunately when he became the boss my father was in prison but his partner tony lee was was out so they definitely benefited from it i benefited from it too once once i stopped once i got clean in 88 and i started making a ton of money around him you know we all benefited from it and we all got hurt by it because of the the you know the, the heat you know like the fbi were all over us the organized crime task forces were all over us i mean every time we got arrested you know we were john Gotti's crew like i got arrested in when i got arrested in, in 89 the headline in the paper was uh, John Gotti's crew arrested in a $15 million bookmaking ring. He had nothing to do with it. And I would go see him and he would go, hey, we made $15 million last year. Where's my money? Like he would tease me, you know, like where's his end? So uh, it, was a, it was a crazy time. How much percentage would Gotti get for everyone who earned? Usually the boss gets 10%. Everything, everything, gets, uh, everything goes up. Everything you like an associate gives an envelope to the soldier. The soldier gives an envelope to the captain, and then the captain gives an envelope to the boss, the underboss, and the and the consigliere. I know my father when my father had dice game, whatever my father did, he gave the bugada. They call it. He gave them ten percent. He gave them ten percent of everything. He kicked up. So, you know, and good fellas that had the JFK heist. How legit was that? The five million was it five million yeah, plus jewelry? Well, I knew all them good. They, I, I, I they, they all come from my neighborhood. I mean, I know them good. Actually, in the movie, in the beginning of the movie, they mentioned my father's name when they panned the, when they panned the um, the restaurant in the beginning, and he's naming all the names: Michael Francis. They say Fat Andy, and uh, and uh, and it's so funny because when I first went to see the movie, I didn't know they mentioned my father. I we knew them. I mean, I knew Paul Ivario since I'm a little kid. I knew Jimmy Burke. I dated his daughter Kathy. Like I knew all of them. Tommy D. Simone, the part Joe Pesky played. He used to take me out with him. Like he would come to my father's bar to meet this guy Paulie G, who was his friend. And he would tell. I was like 19. He would tell my father, "I'm going to take your son with me tonight." And my father told him, "Don't get my son in any trouble." No, don't worry about it. And I used to go out with him, so I knew all of them intimately. So now I'm in the movie theater with all my friends to see Goodfellas, right, for the first time. And they're panning the, the 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 restaurant, and they say my father's. Now I'm in a packed movie theater, and they say my father's name, and all of a sudden, all my friends, 
that's your father. Like, and I saw shit in front of, it was, it was, it was cool. You know, I was, it was cool. So, uh, um, yeah, that 5 million, but you know, a, a lot of people started getting killed. You know, Jimmy Burke, he was there. He, that's a day. Another, you want to talk about dangerous guys, Jimmy Burke, the part that De Niro played, he was a dangerous guy. I mean, he was a dangerous, dangerous guy. And so was Tommy D. Simone. That's why Tommy disappeared. Cause he was killing people that he shouldn't have killed, you know? Um, but, uh, yeah, 5 million, um, it's funny because we used to tease Kathy, his daughter, like, we know you got all the money because Jimmy probably winded up with all the money after he killed everybody. And then he went to prison. He got life for a murder. And we used to tease his daughter, like, where's all the cash, Kathy? You know, it's just, I don't have it. So that's what they'd done then. They, they got the money, but they wanted to keep it from themselves. So they started killing everyone yeah. involved. And the jewelry, actually, the ju the jewelry. So they, they got $5 million in cash, and they also got over a million dollars in jewelry. Actually, the jewelry was fenced by my father and his partner. Because my at the time of the rob, after they did Lutanza, my father had a club called Cafe Liberty. I was in prison when that robbery took place in 79, I think it was. And what happened was after the prison, after the robbery, and they brought all the money and the jewelry back to this guy, Vinny Asaro's cousin's house, they dropped off all the money and the jewelry. They actually went to my father's cafe and celebrated. My father was actually waiting for them and they celebrated the robbery in my father's cafe with my own man. And then um, about a year later, Jimmy Burke and Vinnie Asara, brought, my father had a gold and silver exchange because gold and silver was, Jimmy Carter was the president. He was a sucky president and the economy sucked and like today, <laughs> you know, but I don't want to talk politics and, the, and gold and silver was sky high. So they opened up this gold and silver exchange. So Jimmy Burke and Vinnie Asara brought all the Lutunza jewelry to my father and his partner and they fenced it all and they sold it. And my father actually made like about a quarter of a million dollars for himself with the jewelry. So the one Joe Pesci played, he was a proper nutcase. Oh yeah, he was dangerous. Tommy was, and it's so miscast because Tommy was tall and handsome. Tommy looked more like a movie star than Joe Pesci. Like, so why did they cast Joe then? Because he was he just a great actor. Great he, yeah, I mean, the guy won an Academy. You can't knock yeah. him because he won an Academy mm, Award. Yeah. But as far as casting, like, looks like he did not look anything. Tommy was tall and handsome. Tom, when Tommy walked in the room, he had charisma. He was a sharp dresser. You know, he was a movie star. Tom. Mm. Like, Joe Pesky, short, funny-looking, great actor, but totally doesn't look like him whatsoever. Did he ever get made? Because the day he was getting made, they killed him. Is that correct? That's a true story. <clears throat> he was dangerous. I mean, to clip him would have been a really hard thing to do. They actually believed, he actually believed they were bringing him to the ceremony. I heard, I don't know how true it is, but this is what I heard from other people, that his poor mother actually bought him a new suit for the ceremony. To, you know, when they prick your finger yeah. and all that. And he actually believed he was going to his ceremony and they lured him into this place and he was executed. He was murdered. And what happened to Jimmy after that? Well, then Henry Hill became a cooperator, as like in the movie. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. Jimmy got arrested for um, um, fixing college basketball games in Boston, which they were doing. And he got convicted for that. And when, when he was in prison for that, um, Henry gave up a murder. What happened was he murdered somebody, Jimmy, and Henry helped him put the body in his trunk. And then Jimmy drove off with the dead body and they arrested Jimmy for that murder and he got convicted for that murder. And then he got 25 to life with New York State. And then he actually died of lung cancer. I actually went to his funeral um, and he died of lung cancer when he was in New York State prison. And, and uh, that was the end of Jimmy Burke. I actually, I, that's the, I, that might be the last time I saw his daughter at at his funeral, I went to his funeral. What about Henry? Did you ever come across him? Henry, yeah, Henry and my friend, my father didn't like Henry. <laughs> like, Did he know? Do you think he felt some sort of vibe from him? My father never <laughs> liked him, and he used to just say hello to me and goodbye. Like he never, like I would go to like Robert's Lounge, the bar they hung out in, where um, so underneath the bar was an after-hour club, and I would go there, and Henry would be in there. And he sort of stood away from me because he knew my father didn't like him and he sort of was not, he was a little afraid of my father. And it's funny because years later, Paul Ivario, who was a major player in the in the Goodfellas, um, Paul Savino played Paul Ivario. Um, my father was in federal prison with him in Springfield in the prison hospital and we would go out there and visit them all together. My father, me, 
um, Tony Lee, my father's partner, uh, this guy Danny Cateo, who was a captain in the Lucchese family, Pete the Killer, who was actually the person that allegedly shot Tommy in the in the house. We would go and we would all drive, fly out to Missouri to visit them, and we would be in the visiting room. And my father would tell Paulie Vario, I told you I never liked that Henry Hill. And Paulie would tell my father, Please, Andy, don't break my balls, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, so Henry sort of stood away from me, but I was very, very friendly with the rest of them. When did your dad get convicted? What did he get convicted for? Yeah, my father. So what happened was when I got out of prison in 1980, my father kept on getting subpoenas. There was this DA in Suffolk County, Long Island, that kept on giving my father subpoenas over this bookmaking ring. And so my father to duck him went to Florida, had friends in Florida, in Miami, and they opened up an Italian restaurant down in North Bay Village, and he was sort of bouncing back and forth from Miami to New York, back and forth. And what happened was, um, back then, the mob had control of a lot of bingo halls in Florida, South Florida. It was before the casinos, before the Seminole Indians opened up casinos. Because now in America, the American Indians own all the casinos. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how it is in, in Europe, but that's how it is here. Um, so um, they had all these bingo halls. And um, Paul Castellano, who was the boss at the time, sent for my father to come to New York. He needed to see him. And my father flew up to New York. And he went to see Paul Castellano and Joe Gallo, who was the consigliere, and this guy Joe Piney, who was a captain, and this guy Tommy A. Agro, he was a soldier. Um, they sent, and my father went to meet up with them and Paul Castellano asked my father if he knew the Traficantes. The Traficantes was the mob family out of Tampa, Florida. They sort of ran South, South Florida. And my father said, yes. They said, okay, we need you to represent us with Tommy. There's a beef. We have a beef with them over this big bingo hall. So my father went said, of course, you know, no problem. So my father went down there as, a, as an acting captain and he went to um, meet with the Traficantes with this guy Tommy A and they straightened it out and they went partners and whatever, everything worked out fine. And Tommy A had a crew down there actually. And one of Tommy A's crew members was Bobby D. Simone, who was Tommy D. Simone's brother from Goodfellas. So my father knew Bobby. So he said, when I'm not here, could you service my guys? And my father goes, yeah, no problem. One of them was an informant. One of Tommy guys, this guy, Joe Dogs, And uh, my father started servicing them. And this guy, Joe Dogs, started bringing my father um, Shylock customers, you know. And one of them was an undercover FBI agent. And my father started Shylocking the money. And my father started committing crimes with them. And uh, my father got indicted with Tommy A on a big Rico in Florida. And he got 40 years. How was that feeling? Was, <clears throat> was that... Obviously, you knew your dad's life, but if you start waking up to it, were you still in that life, or was it a relief your dad was awake? Because maybe you wanted to change your life. No, at that point, no, I wasn't. It was, it was, it was not good. You know, it was, it was. Uh, I was very unhappy that he was away, and plus, the, I, I think my own addiction at that point started to escalate a little bit. Um, so when he he got arrested in '84, um, and between '84 and '88, I think those were like the hardest years for me because he was away. And then I was going back and forth. I had a wife now. I had a son, and uh, and I and I had to deal with his lawyers. So I was going back and forth from New John Gotti had become the boss, and I was going back and forth, back and forth from Florida. I was living in hotels. Um, he went on trial three times. My father, he got two. We actually fixed. He got went on trial the first time with Tommy A. They got a hung jury. Then Tommy got lung cancer and died. The second trial, he went on trial with only one other co-defendant. We actually got to one of his jurors. We gave the guy 25000 and he hung the jury. Um, so we fixed that jury. He got another hung jury. Then he went to trial the third time, and he got convicted. And then he got 40 years. To th so I, I was living in hotel. I was just a lot of back and forth. It was rough, a couple of rough years. Then once he got to 40 years in 87... And things settled down. Then I got like control of my life, and that's when I went to treatment and uh, and I got clean. What was it like going to treatment? Because you know yourself, if you're setting up murders, doing murders, blocking out the pain, no emotion, the drugs numbs the pain because you don't really yeah. think straight. It just blocks everything out. But when you start becoming clean, 
And then, you, like you says at the start, the fucking conscience, the trouble you've caused, the pain, the misery, right. the effect it has, not right. just on your sister, your mum, friends, family. It just yeah. spirals. Yeah. See, when you started getting treatment, did that then hit you? What the fuck you were actually involved with? Yeah. The, well, the reason why I went into treatment was because I, I got to a point where I knew that if I was killing myself. I, I was in a lot of physical pain. I was in a lot of emotional pain. And I knew I had to stop Otherwise, I was going to die. Like, and things would, and, and I, and I, I knew I needed to stop, so I addressed that issue. And just like you said, now I'm clean. Now I'm clean, but I'm living this life. I'm clean. I'm hanging out with John Gotti. John Gotti actually bought me a car when I got out of treatment. Like he gave me a car. Now I'm making a lot of money. I'm living this lifestyle, and all of a sudden, I started not feeling good about myself, and I'm wondering, like, what the fuck is going on here? <clears throat> Excuse me. You know, and in spite of, so now I'm clean, I'm making 12 step meetings, I'm hanging out with people that are clean, but I'm still committing crimes, I'm still running around. I actually got arrested clean in 90, in 1990. I was clean already two years, I got arrested. I went to prison clean, I stood clean in prison. I came out of prison in 92, I stood clean again. Four years later, in 95, now I'm clean a bunch of years and I get arrested again. And now I'm going to myself, in spite of myself, I'm feeling uncomfortable now in this lifestyle. I'm saying to myself, why did I get clean? Why, you know, to spend the rest of my life in prison? I got arrested more. I did more time clean than when I was using drugs. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's how. You that, should have got yourself yeah, back yeah, on That's it. how crazy it was. <laughs> I actually, you know, and we laugh about it, but I actually did more time clean than when I was using. Mm -hmm. That's how ironic it was. And just in spite of myself, I started to develop a conscious. And 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 I was in Attica, and um, I was in this cell that was um full of cockroaches. I mean, it was loaded with cockroaches. And I'm trying to clean it up, you know. And uh, I got this ten year sentence, and um, and I was done. Like I just said to myself, "What's going on, man? What am I doing?" You know, I'm, I mean, now I'm clean all these years, and 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 I uh, and I'm thinking about my sister, and I'm thinking about you know. Uh, what I did and who I hurt and all the faceless victims. I mean, I had I had, I had like a stolen car rings. I mean, we stole hundreds and hundreds of cars. I mean, the people's lives that I made miserable. But when I was doing it, I, it didn't phase me. Now, you know, it started just, I started, I, I developed a conscience to make a long story short. But when I got out in 04, I still wasn't ready to, I still couldn't give it up totally. It was like, I knew I was gonna get made, like I was proposed and I and I got permission to go on sit downs and um, and I just did eight years and three months and I actually got my first legitimate job driving a truck that I really liked. Um, and uh, But I still had one foot in and one foot out. And then um, on one sunny day in, in 2005, I'm sitting on a bench and I have my eyes closed. And the next thing I hear, don't move, don't move you scumbag. And I wake up. And I got a gun in my nose and I'm surrounded by FBI agents and I get thrown, handcuffed, thrown in the back of a van and they're screaming at me, you fucking murderer, we got you now, you scumbag. And if I'm gone, now I'm indicted for murder. Now I'm facing life. Now, I'm, now I get out on home confinement and um, my father's dead, John Gotti's dead, Tony Lee's dead, and 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 the people that were and and, I, and I'm going and now now I'm struggling with am I gonna am, are the, is this life is this mafia is this life worth spending my the rest of my life in prison? Am I willing to give up my kids for the rest of my life? And I struggled with that for a year under home confinement. Like I would pick up the phone to call the government and I would hang it up. I couldn't make the call to cooperate. I couldn't do it because I, I saw my father's face and he hated cooperators and I was guilt ridden. And this went on for a whole year. And then finally, um, a lawyer, a mob lawyer called me and said, listen, I've been looking into your case and uh, you need to call the government because these people are going to throw you under the bus. Um, you were the last person with this guy. You picked him up. You drove him to the place. He disappeared. You're finished. You need to you need to call the government. And... and um, the next day, the next day, I still couldn't do it. The next day, I woke up and I had a, the card to the FBI agent, and I gave the card to my wife, Valerie. And I said to Valerie, listen, take this card, and when you go to work, call that number and tell this that guy to come see me. I couldn't call. I couldn't do it. 
and she went to work and she made the call and the agents came to see me and 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 I and that's when I actually threw the towel and it said that I I I have to change I have to get out of this life it's 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 crazy it's abnormal it's not a way to live I have and I and I ended it what evidence did you have against you well, and they how had did they get that what happened was they had a cooperator they had a couple of cooperators my brother-in-law my other brother-in-law from my, my 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 wife's brother wore a wire my my so what happened was the case i got locked up in florida on the rico my first wife alice her brother louis was an informant we didn't know he was working with us he had wore a body wire for a year he taped every conversation we ever had i mean he, ta he in my house i mean he taped so they had a lot of tapes then this guy peter sakara so um my brother-in-law had a partner named Peter Sakara, and after my brother-in-law disappeared, this guy kept coming around our club. So finally, Tony Lee, my own man's partner, chased him, said, don't come around him, and he came back. And I'm outside his house, I'm outside the club with him one day, and I said, Peter, listen, let me ask you a question. I said, you keep coming here looking for Frankie, you're not gonna find him here. I said, let me ask you a question. I said, because this guy was a killer, Peter. I said, if someone beat your mother up, what would you do? And he just looked at me, and he left. He cooperated. They used that one of that statements like that to indict me. So they had a lot of evidence, but they had a lot of evidence circumstance. But the strongest piece of evidence they had was I picked them up. I was a, I picked them up at his house. I, I gave him the story to come. I picked them up. I brought him to the club, and he disappeared. So they had a lot of bits and pieces, and I didn't know everything they had because I never went on trial. But uh, they had enough to convict me, according to the lawyers I spoke to. So did you see anything on tape, or was it just hearsay? You no, I never got. This? I I heard some of the tapes. I heard some of the tapes. I heard some of the tapes, and I saw some of the three o twos. I saw, but then when I cooperated, I didn't see the rest of it because I didn't go on trial. I didn't have access to it. So what are you expecting then? If you didn't cooperate, what would you have got? I wouldn't have got arrested. I mean, I tried to, what happened was when I first got indicted for the murder, I tried to take a plea. So now when I got indicted, I was waiting to get out on bail. So I got a visit from one of the lawyers on the case, one of the, my co-defendants at the time, attorney. So I knew I was guilty and I wanted out of that life, you know? And so I was willing to take a plea. I, I was willing to take 10, 15 year plea. I was still young. I was still in my fifties. I just turned, I think 51. So, I mean, I was willing to go back to prison, not for life, but I was willing to go back. And I got this visit while I was waiting to get out on bail. And this lawyer, Joseph Carraza came to visit me. And he was a, a friend of mine and one of my attorneys. And we're in the visiting room, in the, in the lawyer room. And I told him, listen, I'm willing to take a plea right now, 10, 15 year plea. And he tells me, oh, you would you like jail? I go, no. I said, but this is no bullshit bookmaking case. This is forever. This is a murder. These people are looking to take my life. I said, if you could get, if I could get a plea 10 or 15 years, I'll take it. He told me, <clears throat> we're not taking pleas. So I couldn't plead out without my co-defendants. It was, I had to be, they, which they call a global plea. So I was trapped. It was either go to trial, and then what happened was my co-defendant, actually the guy that shot, that pulled the trigger, we're in a, an attorney meeting, and he's telling me the day of the murder, he was in Florida, that he had paperwork from a travel agent stating that he was in Florida. So he already was fabricating an alibi. So I told him, well, what about me? Like, I'm on, and he just looked at me, he went like that, like, so like, that's when, the penny dropped. That's right. And that's when this other lawyer stepped in and told me, listen, they're looking to throw you under the bus. How long would you have got? <clears throat> if I prison? got convicted, yeah. life. It was a murder. It was life. 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 <clears throat> life. No, I, I, well, well, I was under the old guidelines, so I, I would have been eligible for parole after 30 years. But you'd have been dead then? I would have been in my 80s. So what was that feeling like, being in that life? Your dad, who was 100%, fucking died in prison, mm. never turned. What was that moment when you decided? Because the police must rub their hands with guys in the mafia. They've got a guy to wear a wire, can yeah. get everybody. They've got you to turn. Yeah. They just get everybody to turn. They just play everybody to then turn on. They must just sit back and go, well, we'll get them eventually. But what was that feeling for you to then go, fuck this life? They're, they're trying to get me. I'm going to get them. It was, it, was, it, was, it was the hardest decision I ever made. It was To this day, I still 
wake up sometimes in the middle of the night and I feel terrible. It was just a hard decision, but it was something that I was done. It was like drugs. You know, I, I woke up one day and I was done using. It was just like I woke up one day and I was done living that way. I, you know, like uh, it, it was over. Like I knew it, I knew it was over. I, didn't, I, I knew that it wasn't worth it anymore. I mean, I, mean uh, I wasn't willing to spend the rest of my life in prison for that, for that anymore. I, I, uh, and, and, you know, I, and I say this all the time because it's, it's the God's honest truth. If my father was alive or Tony Lee was alive, his partner, I would have never cooperated because I would have had to give them up. And I would never, ever do that. I would have never done that. So I, I think like all the stars are lined up for me to get out of that life and survive it, if that makes sense. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And and I made the decision. But it was it was it was it was it was a it was a hard, tough, really hard decision. I mean, I still have to live with it. I mean, all these years later, it's still sometimes I have bad days over it. See, if your dad was alive and you decided to cooperate with the government would your dad have killed you i would have never done that but i think my father would have killed himself that's what i think would have happened because once i don't want to mention their names because they're still out there um my father was doing um time with this other wise guy and uh one of his relatives allegedly started cooperating and he came out in the visiting room and uh my father looked at him and looked at me and goes, I can't believe this guy's walking around. If that was me, I'd kill myself. You know, and I have to live with that. You know, I, I, I would, first of all, I know if my father was alive, I would have never cooperated. But if I ever did cooperate and he was alive, he wouldn't kill me, but he would have died. He would have died of a broken heart. He would have, he would have died. What sort of deal then do you get from getting a murder, potentially been in prison the rest of your life? to then cooperate with the coppers? What sort of deal do they put on the table? Well, and how do you trust them as well? well that's, that's a good question. So what you, sign, what you do is you sign a, a, co a cooperation agreement and they give you coverage of, for all. And you have to basically tell them about every crime you know of, every crime you committed, and they give you what they call coverage for everything you weren't charged with. So they gave me coverage for all, like I extorted a, a, um, a water company, I extorted a, a, a vending company. So I got coverage for all that. Um, I was involved in a murder conspiracy to kill this guy, Frankie Geish. I got coverage. So you get, you sign a cooperation agreement and you get coverage. And the only promise that you make, they, they, they gonna, when you get sentenced, they're gonna, they write this paper up about your cooperation agreement and they give it to the judge and they recommend a sentence. And in my case, they were gonna recommend supervised release. Um, and then it's up to the judge basically, but normally the judge is either gonna give you like a couple of years or, 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 or time served. In my case, thank God he gave me time served, but uh, you really don't know what you're gonna get, but it's very strict, it's very, it, you, it's, very li it's very strict. Like if you get caught on one lie, you're out, you get life. Any, 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 any deviation from the cooperation agreement, any making stories up or any lies you get caught in, you violate the cooperation agreement, you're finished. They, they, they kick you to the curb, you get life. But if you f cooperate and you testify when they need you, when you get sentenced, they give this, they, 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 um, they recommend a sentence and, and usually 99% of the time the judge follows it. Like Sammy the Bull committed 19 murders, he got five years. Um, <clears throat> uh, I, I got time served when I got sentenced. I got five years supervised release and time served because I testified at six trials. So, uh, I got time served. So it's all the, it's all up to the, the U S attorney and how they present it to the judge. See when you eventually, see when you turn snitch, does something die inside of you? A man who's lived that life, a man who respected his dad, even though, you know, it was fucked up, a man who's done murders, set up murders, robberies, you've done prison time, you've done nearly 20 years prison time anyway. What happens when you eventually start cooperating? Is it, what's that feeling? Is it a relief? Or do you think, fuck it, I've done it now where there's no going back? No, for me, it was sort of a relief because I knew I was done. I knew I was out of it. You know, there's, you, there's no going back. I mean, once once you talk, even if you even if you have a conversation with them and then change your mind, there's no going back. I mean, once once you open up the door and you talk to the government, whether you continue or not, you're finished with the mob. 
I was just relieved that it, I, it was done. It was over. I was out of it, and and uh, and I and I have to live with the decision. And uh, and it was uh, a new chapter, really. I mean, basically, that's what it was. And you know, and and uh, it was a struggle. You know, for a lot of years, it was a struggle. You know, I lived in states that I lived in Idaho. I mean, listen to my <laughs> listen to our accents. Imagine you and I in Idaho. You know what I mean? Like, imagine me and you living in Idaho. You know, here I am. I'm living in Idaho. Uh, uh, as soon as I open up my mouth, like everybody's staring at me. You know, they had me living in Washington State. You know, then eventually I went back to Michigan. Um, you know, uh, and then I winded up going back to. But then, then you know, then. Um, I started making changes. You know, I was in recovery. You know, I went back to school. You know, then then it's like now, all right, now I'm free of the mob. Now I'm free of. I don't have to worry about going to prison. Now what? You know, now 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 it's either because a lot of guys in my position continue being scumbags and continue make doing stupid shit. You know, not everybody that cooperates changes a lot of guys that cooperate still do the same nonsense which to me is ridiculous if you're going to cooperate and continue doing what you're doing what's the point so now now i have to make changes now thank god my life experience you know i i got an offer to work i got an offer to to move to florida to go work in a treatment center as a counselor and they put me back in school i went back to school um and i'm now i'm already 60 years old now so because when i when i started cooperating i was in my early 50s but i couldn't do anything because i was testifying at trial so the government and the witness protection program gave me money you know paid my way basically and because i was still co -op, uh, still testifying but once that ended now now it's sink or swim now i'm on my own and uh, I went back to school at 60. I became a counselor. I worked as a counselor in the treatment center, which I'm still I'm still working in. Now today I work in a detox, you know. Um, so I went from being a taker to a giver. You know, now I help people instead of hurting people. So, you know, once I stopped cooperating, I had to make some changes. And thank God I, I made some changes for the good. See, when you had to testify in six different cases, did you have to take the stand six different times? Yeah, yeah, I had to testify. It was tough. The first one was tough. The first one I was on the stand for like three and a half days. That was that was a rough one. All of them were rough. I mean, you know, it's like you know, because you're getting attacked, you're getting called names. You know, I did a lot of scummy things. You know, I you know I was no you know I did a, and you know that all comes out. You know, but but you know I I I'm, I was I was I was okay with it because you know what, I accepted the part I played in my life. You know what I mean? I accepted, like, yeah, listen, I, I, I accepted the part I played. And once you accept the part you play, you play in your life, it's okay. You know what I mean? Once I accept it and I, and, and I know I did it and I forgive myself for doing it, you know, I could talk about it, you know, and, and they ask me questions and I, you know, like, and, you know, and I say, yeah, like I, I was so honest testifying that the lawyer would tell me, Really? Like they were like surprised. Like I even answered truthfully. Like I stopped my honesty, stopped them f from going any further because they were ready for me to lie and then they were going to like attack me, you know? And like, so there was a scenario when we fixed the jury in Miami, I was using at the time. So the juror wanted 25,000. So I came to New York and I got the 25,000 from my old man's partner tony lee and i went back to florida with the twenty-five thousand. and when i met with the guy that was fixing the jury this guy billy victor i only gave him twenty thousand, and i said here i'm tell him we're only giving him 20 and i kept five thousand for myself and i blew it i you know i partied with it and the lawyers they knew that so when now I'm testifying and he's going to me. So Tony Lee, who was like your father, Tony Lee, who you loved, Tony Lee, who you lived with, Tony Lee, who grew up with your father, you literally, you robbed 5,000 of him, didn't you? And I looked at him and I said, yeah. And if I could have figured out a way how to rob the whole 25,000, I would have done that too. Because that was the truth. And he just stopped dead in his tracks. Because he was going to wait for me to say, I didn't take no money. What do you? And then they probably had a witness to say that, you know. So so I just was an open book when I testified. But it was tough to testify. Because they, you know, but. Six different trials? Yeah, six trials. Who, who did you testify against? I testified against this guy, Skinny Dom. He was a captain. I testified against this guy, uh, Billy Vic, uh, Billy Bobby Glasses. He was in all murder trials. Uh, Charlie Koenig. 
uh, he was he was melting bodies in barrels of acid. I mean, he was really a crazy serial killer. He was crazy. This is the guy that that this, the guy that ran over John Gotti's son, the guy that killed John. This was the guy that dissolved his body in a barrel of acid. He killed a friend of mine named Michael. He stabbed him. He killed him. I testified. So I testified at Skinny Dom's trial. I testified at Bobby Glass's trial. I testified at Charlie's trial. I testified at this guy Sarah Perone's trial. I testified at another murder trial of this guy Jimmy Bur uh, Johnny Burke. And then the last trial I testified at was the Lutunza trial with Vic Vinny Asara, the sixth trial. Did they all get convicted? Five got convicted, one didn't. One got found not guilty. See, because you done testified so many trials, is that because the amount of information you gave? What happens if you just gave one or two? Yeah, it was. Uh, plus, it was historic. It was, they called me what they call a historic witness because I knew the structure of the mob and I knew. So, you know, you got to understand. I was in the streets since I'm 16 years old. Now I'm in my 50s, so I've been. I was out and I was Fat Andy's son, so I knew a lot of people. I knew a lot of things. I was. A, I did a lot of things with a lot of people. So they called me. What they called me was a historical witness so they would call me like i knew you were a captain i met you as a captain and i would testify yeah i met so and so he was a captain in the banano family but like um well i committed no i didn't because i didn't commit crimes with all of them i committed crimes with dominic i committed crimes with johnny burke and i committed crimes with vinnie asara so out of the three trials i committed crimes with the other trials I knew of, I was involved in the aftermath of their crimes, their murders, like with, uh, with uh, Charlie Koenig. He killed my friend Michael. We had a sit down with them. Like I, so that was what I testified. Like he killed my friend Michael. We had a sit down at, you know, and so I, I had some historical information. Bobby Glasses, he killed uh, with Frankie Geish. They committed a double homicide with Frankie Geish, who was with us. So I had intimate knowledge of the murders. So I testified at those kind of trials, trials like that. Could, could people I, could people sort of tell lies though? Could people make up lies that they were here? Is it just your statements that convicts well, them? You could lie, but believe it or not, the government knows the truth. Everything they because the everything. wires listen, and shit. Yeah, they, listen, when I was proffering with the government, they knew shit that I forgot about. They told me stuff I did, and I went, like, how did you know that? Like they know everything. They, they know we shot a guy years ago. We shot a guy named Louis Baja. Like, I forgot about it. Like, and he didn't die. When he got shot, he didn't die, but he got messed up and he went back. He was a Puerto Rican kid. He went back to Puerto Rico. I forgot about it. I And I didn't think anybody even knew about it. And I'm proffering. And one of the, the agents tell us, okay, now tell us about Louis Baja. I almost fell out of the Louis Baja. How the fuck do you know about Louis Baja? They know everything. They know everything. So for you to lie, it's dangerous. Once you sign that cooperation agreement and you're going to lie, you know, like gas pipe, like people that lied got thrown out of the program <clears throat> and got life. So if you're going to lie, you're playing a dangerous game. with The government don't play. When you sign that cooperation agreement, any little deviation, you're gone. They kick you to the curb. They have no use for you. You once they have no use for you, you're finished. See when you had to sit in the dock, where you what was the eye contact like? Were you just looking down? When I signed the cooperation no, agreement. No, when you were had to take the stand. What was that like? It must have been when I had tiring. to take the, when yeah. I had to take the stand. I made sure I stared in everybody's face. I don't want. I I, I wouldn't give anybody because. Not that I was proud of what I was doing, because I was far from it, but I wasn't a punk, and I wasn't going to cower. So when I walked into the courtroom, before I sat down, I looked right at the person I was testifying against. I looked right in their face, and then I sat down. And then, and then once the questioning starts, you get its tunnel vision. Then it's just you and whoever's questioning you, and you sort of block everything else out. But I made sure every time I sat down, I looked at the person that I was testifying against. And only one of them ever like, it was funny because we had like this moment in court, like Vinny Asara, he just had passed away, the poor guy, but he was a captain in the, the Lutunza case. That was the, he, he got found not guilty, which was amazing. So we had this moment, like they brought me out to the into the courtroom. And for some reason he was the only one there with that 
agents and his lawyer. The jury wasn't there or the judge wasn't even there. And they usually they brought me out after the jury came in, but they brought me out, the agents. And, and, and as I was sitting down, I looked at him and he was sitting there and he called me a rat. He goes, like that. And I went like this to him. And I looked at him and I just went like this. And I gave him the finger like that. And he, he was so mad. He was so mad. You know? but I, and I just looked at him and I went like this. <laughs> to him like that. He was so mad. Oh my God, he was jumping around. But uh, yeah, no. Uh, but once you start testifying and the lawyers start, especially when you're getting cross examined, because they're coming, they're coming for you. You know, defense lawyers are coming for you, and it's like it's like tunnel vision. You just zoned in on what's happening, and you you don't see nobody else. Because you obviously people will call you at this and that, but they've never yeah. lived that life. They don't know the life. Everybody's a fucking snitch, seeming yeah. by the looks of it. But see. It might sound weird, but see, when you were actually testifying and giving statements, was it actually like a therapy for yourself? Just fucking releasing everything that you bought yeah, up it was, here? Yeah, it was just, you know, well, not when I was testifying, when I profited, when I met with the agents and the U.S. attorneys, after I was done, like they were all day sessions, I was just like relieved. It was just, you know, it was just coming to an end and, you know, and, and, and it was over, you know. I was just ready to, to move on at that point, you know. I, the only, I was just ready to move on. I knew that I didn't want to live that way anymore. It's like I just didn't want to do it anymore. I didn't, I didn't want to live that way. I, I wanted to do something else. I didn't want to go to prison anymore. I didn't want to, I didn't want to commit crimes anymore. I mean, I, my whole life was a crime. I had no skills. I don't, to this day, my life experience saved me. My life experience with, in recovery, my life experience with crime, how to change it. That's, that's my, my, my education was the street. I use my street education now to work in treatment because I, I was a criminal. Like people, all these kids did time. Once I tell them I did time, they're locked in. I'm, you know, I have something to offer now. This is, you know, yeah, I lived that way. And that, and you think it's glamorous, but it's not. Look at me. And so, my life experience now was my education. I don't know how to fix anything. I was talking about this last night. I don't know how to use a tool. My father didn't teach me shit. My father taught me how to be a criminal, how to be a mob guy. He didn't teach me how to fix a flat, build a cabinet, turn a screw, use a screw. He didn't teach me shit. Like when I started cooperating, I had no skills whatsoever. I couldn't do nothing. I didn't know how to do I had no education. I had nothing, you know, but my life experience offered me, you know, I, I became a counselor because of my life experience. So see, when you testify against everyone, mm. how long did that take to go over the six court cases? Was that a few oh, it years? Took years? It took years. I started <clears throat> cooperating in, in 05. I didn't finish cooperating until uh, 2014. I didn't start, uh, 2014, the, like the, the, I got sentenced. I got sentenced to the last trial I testified at was in 2014. Or 2015, I'm not sure. Um, but that was the last case. I, I got sentenced in 2000. I got sentenced in October of 2014. And then I, got, I testified at one more trial after that. And that was the end. I testified at the at the Lutonza trial. That was the last trial I testified at. So see when you start testifying, do they give you money every month and put you in a witness protection I program? After, I was... I, I, in the beginning, I went into the witness protection program. They changed my name. They gave me a driver's license, a social security card, a passport. They bought me a car. And then I signed, I lived in Idaho. <laughs> I lived in Washington State. Then I signed myself out of the witness protection program. And I drove back to Michigan. And then the FBI were giving me uh, money every month, like a stipend every month to pay my bills. And then when I stopped testifying, um, after the last trial, they gave me like a lump sum of money and that was it. It was over. Then I, but I was working by then I was a counselor. I was already in 2014. I went back to school and I got a job as a counselor in training in a treatment center. <clears throat> do you still, do you have a fear for your life now? I don't have a fear for my life. I mean, I don't want to, I don't go to my neighborhood. I mean, I'm not going to disrespect them. I'm not going to put it in their face, but it's not what it was. I mean, there's nobody out there now. That, I mean, are there people out there that are capable of killing me? Without a doubt. Are there still killers out there that I know? Definitely. But are they going to come and look for me? I don't think so. Is anybody going to give them the orders to come and kill me? With the, with the way that it is today, with all the confidential informants and the technology, and I don't think anybody's going to come for us no more. I think if, it, if they were going to do that, they would have done it already. How strong were the Gambino family? How strong were yeah. they? Oh, they were 
powerful. They were the they were the strongest at one time. I mean, when I first got involved, they were they ran the show. I mean, them and the Genovese family were always the two strongest families. What's your biggest regret in that life? That I got involved in it. My, big, <laughs> <laughs> my biggest regret was that I, I, I didn't stay in school. I didn't get an education. Um, the biggest regret is that I hurt my family. I hurt my sister and my niece. You know, what I did to the husband was horrendous. You know, it's terrible. You know, I still deal with it today. You know, my, you know, um, my relationship with them is not good, you know, because of what I did. That's probably my biggest regret. If I had it, even though he was dangerous... If I had it to do over again, I I I, I might have tried to 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 not do what I did, you know, not make that happen. That's probably my biggest regret. Even What's though the, even though he did beat my mother up, even though he did hurt my mother, but I I, I I regret the fact that I hurt my sister and my niece. What's the worst thing you've seen in that life? The worst thing I've seen is the damage we do to our families. That's what I see. The damage we do it to our wives, you know, we all had girlfriends and we were womanizers and the damage that it does, like our kids crying in prison visiting rooms, that daddy, when are you coming home? I think that's the that's the that's the most damage I saw outside of the violence. I mean, because the violence when the violence is happening, like I said earlier, that's just part of the game. And the violence that's perpetrated are against people that know the deal. You know, Sammy the Bull talks about it all the time. Yeah, we kill people, but we kill people that break the rules. Not that that makes it right. Don't get me wrong. Killing is killing. I mean, there's no, it's wrong. But the people that die know the deal. Um, and yeah, though I, the, the thing I, I mean, I saw people get shot in the head. That's horrible. But I think the worst thing I saw was my <clears throat> daughter crying in the visiting room that she had to leave me and go home. I mean, that's terrible. I got arrested in my house. In 1995, my daughter was in her diapers. I'm sitting on my couch handcuffed. They're in my house wrecking my house because they have a search warrant. And my daughter's in her diapers going, Daddy, are these your friends? You know, that's terrible. Yeah. Do you feel as if, do you believe in heaven and hell? Do you believe in? I do. I believe, I believe, I believe in forgiveness. You know, I, 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 I pro I'm, I, I'm not, I'm not a, I'm not born again. You know, I'm not, I'm, uh, and some of my friends are, and it's great. You know what I mean? I do, I am, I do go to church on Sunday. I go to Catholic mass. I'm still trying to be a good little Catholic boy. I do go to Catholic church and I believe, I believe in forgiveness and I believe that, uh, that, uh, hopefully I'll be forgiven, you know? Yeah. And I believe in that definitely without a doubt. And uh, sometimes I, you know, I talked to a friend of mine. He was, he's a pastor. He was a real street guy and he was dangerous. He did a lot of bad things, but now he's, he, he's, he's a pastor. And I ask him all the time, do you really think that, cause we and him and I did a lot of things together. I go, you really think we could be forgiven? I mean, we were, we were bad. And he goes, yeah, we can be forgiven. Do you have nightmares? Uh, I do. I don't have, I don't have night i have i have yeah it's funny because i have guilt dreams like i have a dream that um i'll i'll be with my father and i'm talking to him and, and in my head i'm going does he know i cooperated you know like or i have a dream i'm in jail and i'm walking through the jail and i'm going you know someone's going to find out i it's always about cooperating my dreams are always about cooperating and i'll wake up in the middle of the night how hard does it been for your mom Seen her son going to prison, seen her husband dying in prison. No, my father died when he got out of prison. Oh, did he die? What age did your dad get out? 72. He got out. He did 13 years and he got <clears> out <throat> and then he passed away 18 months later. No, it was hard. It was hard on everybody. I mean, it was my mother, you know, like I said, at the end, at the end of the day, when I finally told her what happened and she just looked at me and she just says, I can't believe he made, he made you do stuff like that. Like my mother, I think mother's. And wives even are in some sort of denial of what we do, you know. Like, um, if that makes sense, I think there's 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 some sort of denial in our lifestyles as far as they're concerned until like the reality hits them in the face, you know. So uh, yeah, it was hard on her. It was hard on her. It's hard on my grandmother. My poor grandmother. I was the oldest grandchild. She used to look at me and go, "What happened? You were such a nice little boy." Mm -hmm. What happened to you? You know, my little Sicilian grandmother, she used to tell me that all the time. She used to go, what happened to you? You were such a good boy. 
Because obviously you speak about your own son and like you speak earlier, your dad, you're setting up murders, he's getting angry because you're not killing someone. Yeah. How hard is that to see a father doing that to his own son, knowing that you're a father now? And like I said earlier, I don't let my sons have have a sleepover or nothing like that. Yeah. So, But how is that? Do you feel sorry for your dad or kind of because he never had anybody to guide him? How, does it, how do you feel about I, it? I, I feel... He that's what he knew. He was a good father. Don't get me wrong. He, when I was a kid, he was great. He loved us to death. He did everything with us. He's provided. He took me to Yankee Stadium. He took me to the. He loved boxing. He loved baseball. He, he so he turned me on to all that. He taught me how to play little. He came to every one of our little league games. I mean, you know, um, he was a good father. He just that's all he knew. And he just thought that was right. He believed in that. He believed in 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 that life, like that was in his blood, and that's all he knew. And he thought that was the right thing to do. And he just did the best he could with what he had. Because everything's changed now. Like you say, the ma mafia's kind of fizzled out. It was not really. It's not the same as it was. But how do you feel when you see everybody speaking out now and trying to teach people not to make the same mistakes? Whether people believe. Whether well, people like to see people snitching or not, it doesn't matter. They've never lived that life. But how is it when you see everybody? I, I don't mind the guy who's been in that life, tries to change it, and then tries to help other people for the better because they're the ones who can teach, not someone who understands it from books or TV. It's just someone who's lived it, someone who's caused misery and pain and destruction their whole life, and the people around them, they can then they can maybe go to prisons and schools to teach people listen, don't fucking make the same mistakes. Because I was always grew up with, that was su such a glamorous life. Back in Scotland, Glasgow, it's high crime. It was a murder capital of the Europe, I think, for a period. But when I seen men, fancy cars, the beautiful girlfriends, money in their pocket, the convertibles, I used to think, wow. But then 10 years later, 15 years later, you see the destruction. They're in prison. The girlfriends are damaged. Mm -hmm. They come out of prison. They try and get back what they've lost. They never, ever do. There's no one I know gets out of that life, ever. Yeah. You know, I, I use my father and John Gotti as examples all the time. I tell everybody, listen, all that glitters isn't gold. Yeah, it looks great. It looks flashy. I loved it. When I got involved in it, when I was 16, that's... I I I wanted it bad. I thought it was I was enticed in it, but at the end of the day, none of those are. There's no success stories in the mob. John Gotti was the biggest gangster since Al Capone. Look at Get Gotti. Get Gotti. That I just did is a smash hit around the world, smash hit. Meanwhile, John Gotti got life in prison, died like a dog chained to a bed that's not a success story my father fat andy made tons of money helped everybody did a lot bad and good did 13 years in prison came out of prison had no every, all his friends were dead i was in prison he had a list of 200 people on his list that he couldn't talk to he couldn't go nowhere he couldn't do nothing he was broke he died alone and miserable that's not a success story. There are no success stories in the mob. That's the bottom line. And I do that all the time. I put stuff on my Instagram. I talk about that on my podcast. That I put I put pictures of from federal prison of me and my family that I took when I was a federal prisoner of me, my wife, and my two kids. I put pictures on my Instagram, my Facebook, and on my show. And I say, for all you Italian kids out there that think the mob's all that, this this is your future Christmas card picture, and it's a federal prison picture. You know, like this is your future. You know, so I try to discourage people in that way because there's no success. Listen, um, I changed. I I became a counselor. Yes, my people say I'm a success story. No, I'm not. I did a lot of damage. You know, I missed, I missed, I missed my kids growing. I went to prison. My daughter was three. I came out, she was 11. My son was 13. I came out, he was 21. I missed, I gave up everything for that lifestyle. That's not a success story. Look what I did. Did I make some changes? Yes, I did. Do I help people now? Do I try to make amends for my life? Yeah, I do. Because that brings me peace. By me helping you brings me some peace, brings me some, you know, get rid of some guilt that I'm doing the right thing now. But my life isn't a success story. I did a lot of damage. How did Get Gotti come about? <laughs> That's a good question. So what happened was, so I started in this, 
doing these things, right? Um, so um, I did a I wrote I did an article for this guy uh, La Costa Nostra News. It's like a newspaper. This guy writes articles about mob guys, mobs. So I did I did a story with this guy. And this company, Raw Production, who did Fear City, reaches out to him and asks him to recommend somebody for the show. So he recommended me. So they contact me, and we have a conversation, and they liked what I had to say, and they, they hired me for the show. But originally, it was supposed to be Fear City 2. So Netflix did a show a few years back called Fear City. Michael Francis was in it. Johnny A. Light was in it. A couple of guys, and it was a hit. It was, it, was, it, was, it was in the top 10 in Netflix. It was a big hit. So now Netflix wanted to do Fear City 2, but they didn't want the same people in it. They wanted new people, so they brought me in. I didn't know they brought Andrew in, and I didn't know they brought Sal, and I, they wouldn't tell me who else was involved. So they bring me in to do Fear City 2. I do my bid. I come up to New York. We film all day and blah, blah, blah. So I do my skit. About two months later, they call me, and they go, listen, we showed it to the executives at Netflix, and they said it's really good. It's so good, they're going to rename it and give it its own show, which is really good for me. Because now I'm away from Fear City 2 and I'm on, it's on its own. But they didn't have a title yet for it. And then a little later on, they called me and they said they renamed it Get Gotti. And uh, it's going to come out on October 24th and so on. But I never, in my wildest dreams, thought it was going to be the hit that it, that it is. So what happened was we were just hoping, me and my team, my, my manager, Pasquale, we were just hoping that in the first month it would hit like in the top 10, like... You know, um, because, you know, there's a lot of stuff out there about John Gotti, you know what I mean? So, you know, it's not like it's something new. So we were just hoping in the first month it would hit number, you know, in the top 10. So it comes out on the 24th. I watch it. It was, they did a phenomenal job. I mean, it was really good. They put some stuff in it that nobody ever knew of, of, and, you know, we all did a good job and, so, and it was good. The next morning I get up like five o'clock in the morning and I'm drinking my coffee and I'm, and I put on Netflix to see and I put on Netflix and, and I go to like the top 10 shows in the country and I click it and I go, what? Get Gotti, number one. I jumped up off my couch. I got my phone. I started text five in the one. I'm texting everybody. The show's number one. The show, I'm taking pictures of the TV. They're like blew me away. And ever since then, like things have been going really well. You know, that's just goes to show you, listen, I we did good in it, but you know, that just goes to show you of the mystique and, 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 of John Gotti, like people are just fascinated with the, with the mob, but people got to know, like, I, and I wrote about it. I said, Get Gotti is a great show, but listen, it's not a love story. It's a tragedy. It's a story about a tragedy because we hurt a lot of people along the way. And that man died handcuffed in bed with cancer, hand, chained to a bed. Yeah. You know, he, he was chained to a bed when he died, literally. Why? Because he was in federal hospital? prison when he died. Was yeah, he was hospital? in a prison hospital. Yeah. 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 I mean, so, you know, so it's, you know, I, I said people got to understand Get Gotti was a great show. And I love the fact that it's a huge hit. And I love the fact that it's bringing me a lot of attention. But at the end of the day, it's a tragedy. It's about a tragedy. How is Gotti's family? Did you ever see them or speak to them? What did they say? I don't speak to them anymore. I mean, they, then, they're, I don't know. I mean, I, I, you know, they're not saying nice things. They're not saying nice things. I mean, that. But you can understand that. Yeah, well. I, I, I get it. I get it. I get it. You know, I get it. Um, but uh, it's their father. You know, it's their father. So they're not they're just, just not, not no. This one of his daughters, she has a little. She has a podcast, and she's been on there. She's not happy with it. But uh, th overall, they haven't really said much outside of one of his daughters. What about Andrea? I love Andrea. I had, to, had her on the podcast yesterday, but I know uh, Francesi and uh, Sam and the Bull have kind of fired shots. I know, you know, I know. How? Because I think she's legit. I think the way she talks, the way she presents herself, you know, she did she's a, solid. Listen, she did a great job on the show. The show's a smash hit. You can't, you know, you can't really knock anybody that was on the show because the show was such a huge hit. If every, if people didn't like what was going on, the show wouldn't have been a huge hit. You know, everybody's entitled to their opinion. You know, uh, 
I like her. I got, we had a great time yesterday. I did her podcast yesterday. I didn't know she was on the show till I saw the show. Yeah. They wouldn't tell us who was on the show. I didn't know Sal was on the show till I saw the show. I didn't know the agents were on the show till I saw the show. But, you know, she was, a, you know, I know the people she dated. I know Frankie Lino. I know Mark Ryder very well. I knew his son, Greg, very well. Uh, she said she hung out in Club Bay. I hung out in Club Bay. So she was definitely around, you know, um... And she's, uh, she's, I, I like her. Yeah, that Matt Ryder was proper. Uh, he, uh, it was Andrea was saying about the heroin and stuff. Oh, he was the major heroin. <clears throat> he was a millionaire. He was a major. He was Nicky Bonds's, Nicky Bonds was one of the biggest heroin dealers in Harlem. He was Nicky Bonds's connection. Who was the American gangster when, when Washington played the part? That was, that was, uh, yeah, he, well, in, in that movie, <clears throat> Nicky Bonds, the character Nicky Bonds is in that movie. He's the flashy guy, the young guy that he's always trying to school. Like he calls kills him. him. No, he doesn't kill him in the movie. The, the, Nicky Bonds, when he gets arrested, Nicky Bonds sort of took over Harlem. But Mark was selling heroin to them guys. I mean, Mark was, Mark, and he was a very sharp guy, Mark. I liked Mark. We got along good. He was very sharp, always well-dressed, ton of money, big money, big, you know, big heroin dealer. John, very close to John, very tight with John Gotti. Um, good guy. I knew his son well. I did business with his son. Unfortunately, <coughs> his son was murdered by Tommy Karate, another mm -hmm. crazy mob killer. Um, but his son, we did business together. Actually, his son had a vending company, and he was putting, uh, he put his machines in a uh, number of spots. I knew his son, Greg, good up until he got murdered. So Greg was definitely, uh, um, and Mark were legit. Do you have any friendships now from people from the past in that life? I do. I I do talk to people. I can't. I won't say who they are, but yeah, I talk to people. I still. I still have my finger on the pulse a little bit. I get. You know. I talk to people. You know. I was around so long. You know. Listen. People. Some people agree what I did, and some people hate what I did. You know. And that's that's okay. But yeah, I still talk to people. Tell me that, Anthony. Do you miss that life? Sometimes I do. You know, my I tell my kids that I I miss I miss the money. I miss the money. A lot of money. I made a lot of money, and I missed I miss I missed yeah. I miss, you know what I miss? I miss the 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 perks. I miss like not waiting online. I miss you know sitting being able to afford to sit in the first row at a concert. You know now I have to sit like in the mezzanine. You know, um, I miss the celebrities. I miss going out. I miss being the center of attention. Yeah, definitely. How's life miss, now? content you know like to bet, you know how i explain my life today is uh it's i'm content i was never content even when i was in, you know in the mob and i was in the street i always wanted more i always wanted more of everything more money more woman more st always more more drugs more co oh, more 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 that was my middle you know that's my my motto more now i sit i wake up in the morning you know, I wake up, my cat comes and sits next my cat comes and sits next to me with my coffee and, and you know, I'm just content. I have a nice condo, I have a job, I don't have to worry about getting arrested, I'm not gonna hurt nobody today, and finally I'm content. Do I struggle? Yeah, I have normal struggles today, financial struggles, you know, health. I have you know, my normal health issues for my age, but I uh, but I'm content today. What's the biggest life lesson that you have learned? Like I said before, man, that all that glitters isn't gold. The biggest life lesson I had was, you know, um, don't let the flesh fool you, man. Don't let the flesh fool you. Where do you go forward for the future? Going forward, well, I'm working. I still work in the dealership. I have my show. I say I got the shirt made special for you. Yeah. Reform gangsters. I got my podcast. I'm doing um, uh, December second. I'm filming a documentary with the History Channel about the mob in Miami. I'm working on a book deal, so a lot, you know, I, I just get Gotti thing, and uh, I did, I did, for, I did, a, I did a table in the back with Sammy the Bull. That sort of gave me, that sort of gave me a little boost also. But this get Gotti thing, like, really gave me a boost, and now things are starting to come my way. So I'm gonna be, uh, I'm gonna be involved in a couple of good projects. Did you ever think with giving statements again, people that you'd be able to sit and walk around and people want photos and people doing podcasts. Right. Did you ever think that was possible? No, never. 20 I, years no, ago. Listen, I went out to a restaurant last night with my friend, you know, where her daughter works, a really nice restaurant downtown. And, uh, and you know, people recognize me like, oh my God, I saw you on Get Gotti. Are you the guy up from the show? Like one guy heard my voice and goes, 
oh my God, your voice is in my brain. I just left my house and you have the same voice. I, I said, you were watching Get God? He went, yeah. He goes, yeah. He goes, oh my God, it's you. <laughs> yeah, so, and even now at the gym, I see people staring at me like the juice girl said, I saw you on TV, you know. But now people, yeah, so it's kind of cool. We're living in a day and age though, whether people are murderers or drug lords or snitches or whoever it is, people are still getting accepted to then yeah. still do things with their life, which is, which is fucking mad. You wouldn't have seen that <laughs> yeah. 20 years ago, no, 30, 40 Listen, years ago. You know, Michael Francis, you know, it's funny. The first time we spoke on Zoom, him and I, I did his show first, his sit down, and and he, you know, we know each other from from way back. And he goes, "Could you believe? Would you think thirty years ago that you and I would be talking on Zoom right now?" I go, "Not at all." And even getting into this whole thing, I didn't, this wasn't even a thought in my mind. I was working in a treatment center, and my phone rang one day, and it was a friend of mine telling me that Johnny A Light wants to talk to me. And I said, I give him my phone number. So next thing, Johnny A. Light calls me and says, listen, I'm doing a show for National Geographic and they keep hearing about you and your father. Would you be interested in doing it? I go, yeah. Like, it just, I said, oh, all right, you know, fine. And this guy, Max Stern from London, you know, I don't know if you know him. He, he, he works for, uh, he's a producer, director. He calls me, we have a conversation and they put me in Narco Wars, The Mob, you know, and I, and I did this show. Drugs, Bugs, and the Dap Don, you know, and then uh, I did that show, then I did Vlad TV, and then uh, and then I got a manager, and then boom, and that one thing left, then the next thing I have a podcast, and then, you know, I'm, and then just now it's getting like, you know, it's, it's, it's rolling, yeah. What's, um, what is your podcast, what's your clothing brand, what's your social media for people to get Yeah, my So my, my podcast is Reform Gangsters, it's on YouTube, subscribe. My, my my Instagram is son of a gangster Anthony Regina Jr. My Facebook's Anthony Regina Jr. and uh, and my 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 uh, my uh, my uh, website is anthonyregianojr.com. So, but subscribe to Reform Gangsters Patreon. I got a Patreon page. Mm -hmm. I'm going to start doing on one on which I'm going to start doing on Wednesday, um, the 22nd at seven o'clock Eastern Standard Time. I'm going to start doing what we call a recovery sit down. And I'm going to, for people that are in recovery or people that are struggling with addiction, if they want to come on, we're going to have a little platform. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. For anybody that's watching that's struggling with addiction now, what advice would you have for them? My advice would, for them is to just, uh, get to a meeting a day at a time, talk to somebody, you know, reach out to somebody and, you know, feelings aren't facts. Just because you feel like using doesn't mean you have to use. There's, you know, you got to put some time in between you and the last one and try to get into treatment, try to get into treatment, try to get to a 12 step meeting. Um, me, I just don't use no matter what, you know, I have this motto, no matter what I'm going through, I know that you have to accept, once you cross over the imaginary line into addiction, there's consequences. And for me, listen, I would love to have a glass of wine. I would love to, you know, I would love even sometimes, I'm going to be honest, to do a line of Coke. <laughs> same. Yeah, you know, you know, same. You know I, I, and, if I, and if I said I didn't, I'd be a liar, you know. But unfortunately for me, when I do those things, there's consequences. And that's what I don't want to live with. That's what I don't want to accept is the consequences. And for people that are struggling, you have to accept the consequences. Once you cross over the imaginary line into addiction, the party's over. That's it. No matter what you do, you're never going to be. Ha it's never going to work. No more. It don't work. Accept the consequences and 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 not use. Anthony, listen, I thoroughly enjoyed your story. Thanks for coming right. on today. Would you like to finish up on anything else? No, just subscribe. Uh, you know. We formed gangsters and I had a great time here. And uh, maybe we could do it again. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> God bless you, mate. Uh, All the best. Thank you. Thanks. Yes, cheers, right. mate.